Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 10? We're in chapter 10 today, and as you're getting there, I'm going to review the plagues that we have studied up to this point. That first plague with the waters turned to blood, the second one with frogs, the third one with lice, and then the second trio, flies and the disease of the livestock, and then boils. We were studying that last week along with the seventh plague of hail. And then today we'll study the eighth and ninth plagues of locusts and darkness. So these plagues, at least the first nine, run from chapter 7 to chapter 10. Over and over, Pharaoh has refused to obey God and let his people go. And over and over, God has sent additional judgments. As we looked at last week, even those judgments, even those warnings were actually tokens of God's mercy. That he was extending another opportunity to repent, another opportunity to obey. Let's stand, please, and I'm going to read our chapter for today. This is chapter 10 of the book of Exodus. You follow along, please, as I read. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory, and they shall cover the face of the earth, so that no one will be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail, and they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses, the houses of all your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were on earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones who are going? And Moses said, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, The Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, the evil is ahead of you. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desired. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants or the fields throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, 
and he did not let the children of Israel go. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take heed to yourself, and see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, You have spoken well. I will never see your face again. Let's pray together, please. Our Father, in many ways this is familiar territory, and yet in many ways it is not. We have never experienced a locust plague. We have never experienced three days of darkness. But Lord, some of us have experienced, and maybe some still are experiencing, a hardened stubborn, rebellious heart. So I pray, Lord, that you would work in each one of us today, that you would soften our hearts, that you would draw us close to you, that you would teach us what you want us to learn from this passage. Father, I ask for the help of your Holy Spirit that you would speak through me, that you would anoint me with your power, that your word would go forth and accomplish what you want it to in our hearts today, that we would have ears to hear. Please give us ears to hear today, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Last week, we focused our attention on the reasons God judged Egypt with plagues. And I offered you five of them from chapter 9. I'm just going to tell you quickly. I'm not going to preach that sermon again. But it was to show God's uniqueness, to reveal his mercy, to display his power, to promote his name, and to exercise his authority. That's what we spent time on last week. Today, we're going to see some more reasons that God sent the plagues, primarily in verses 1 and 2. But then we're going to spend some additional time. We're going to consider the compromises that Pharaoh proposed. Two of them happened back in chapter 8, and two of them happened in our passage today. The first one was, stay in the land. The second one was, don't go very far away. The third was, don't take your little ones. And the fourth one was, don't take your livestock. And if you don't get that written down right now, if you're trying to take notes, we're going to come back to them a little bit later on. But those are the compromises. Pharaoh was not willing to humble himself. He was not willing to obey what God was commanding. And instead, he kept saying, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, how about we do it this way? And he's trying to bargain with God, and folks, that does not work. God is sovereign. He is in control of all things. All that he does is good and right. And our part is to obey. So here's here's the main point. Here's the gist of what I want to us to take with us today as we look at these two plagues and at at the four different compromise offers, I want us to remember this. Don't compromise your faith and don't compromise your obedience. And we'll come back to that. For right now, let's go to verse 1 and we'll work back, back through pretty much a paragraph at a time. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants that I may show these signs of mine before him and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. 
Now, where we pick up in verse 1 is a continuation of last week. Pharaoh's heart is hard. And now we start seeing the statements that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God is locking in the rebellious, stubborn, resistant heart of Pharaoh and his servants. We've talked about that. The purpose for these signs, the purpose for hardening the hearts is stated here. The purpose is for God to show his signs. Why? Well, the next purpose statement, that you may tell your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done. God wants his people to tell his works. God wants us to tell others about what he's done. And specifically, he wants us to tell our children and our grandchildren. But again, I'm going to ask you, why? Why does he want us to talk about the cool things, these plagues of Egypt? Why does he want that passed on from one generation to another? Is it just so we all think, okay, God's cool. He can do some neat stuff. That's good, but that's incomplete. Because here's the answer right here in our passage. That you may know that I am the Lord. We've seen that statement several times. And early on, it was that Pharaoh would know who Yahweh is, that he would know me. But now, beyond Pharaoh and the Egyptians knowing who God is, I want my people, my chosen people, the children of Israel, to know me. And here's how they're going to learn who I am through these works, through these wonders, through these signs that I have done in getting victory over the Egyptians. The purpose of the signs and wonders was so that the Egyptians and especially the Israelites would know the one true God. This principle is not unique to this passage. If we go later in the writings of Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we read this. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Why? So that you'll remember, so that you'll understand, and so that you'll pass down from one generation to another who I am and what I've done. God commanded his people to teach their children diligently. Did you catch that? to teach them diligently. But if you read further in the Bible, you find this alarming statement when we get to Judges chapter 2. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. So we have this command we just read in Exodus chapter 10. We have the command we just read in Deuteronomy 6, and they weren't doing it. That's the only way there could be a new generation who didn't know the Lord or his works. We aren't Israel. But I think the principle applies to us, to our parents. How are we doing? Are we diligently teaching our children and grandchildren the ways and the works of the Lord? And before you reply with what you know is the right answer, yes, we do. Ask yourself the question, what have you done this weekend to teach your children or grandchildren the ways of the Lord? What have you done this past week to teach your children or grandchildren the ways of the Lord? If you don't have children or grandchildren, what have you done to teach other children, even in this congregation, the works and ways of the Lord? Have you taught them the Bible on their level? Have you prayed with them? Have you told them the stories of God's faithfulness in your life? Have you done that so often that they can repeat it word for word with you? I don't mean to be obnoxious about it, but that we are recounting as the Israelites were supposed to do in their context, here's what God has done for me. Here's what God has done for our family. Are you telling them? Are you teaching them? Verse 3. So Moses and Aaron came in to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long, pay attention to that phrase, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me, or else. Don't you love it when God says, or else? 
Or else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory, and they shall cover the face of the earth, so that no one will be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail, and they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses, the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And this unique statement, right at the end of that verse, Moses turned on his heels and left. It's the only time it's worded that way. But what I want to key in on for that paragraph is the question. Could it be that God is asking one or more of us that same question this morning? How long will it be until you humble yourself before me? Another way we could say it is, how long will it be before you submit to me? Submit your will to mine. That's what God is saying. As we talked about last week, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you want to receive God's mercy and grace, and I do, if you want to receive his mercy and grace, if you want to receive his offer of salvation, humble yourself before him now. Verse 7, Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long, there it is again, shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? So remember, Moses has left, presumably Aaron also. And Pharaoh's servants may have had to summon up their courage because they're, they're blaming it on Moses, but they're really telling him, you're messing this up. How long are you going to allow this man Moses to be a snare to us? See, the second time someone asks him how long, seemingly in a short period of time, this is directed at Pharaoh, and this time his servants ask him, how long are you going to let him ensnare us? Have you looked out the window? Egypt isn't doing very well. We are destroyed. Our land is destroyed. Our crops are destroyed. Our herds, our livestock are dead. How long until you give in? I think that's what they're asking. But here's the part, selective hearing. Pharaoh seemed to have selective hearing. Because here's what he latched on to. Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. And what they meant was, let him go. Be done with it. Give up. I think that's what they're counseling him to do. And here's what he heard. Let the men go. Just, just the men. We'll go with that. Verse 8, so Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, go, serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones who are going? Trick question. And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Moses understood God did not want just the men to go. God wanted the entire family to go and worship together. It wasn't enough for the men to go. Why? Well, we have a clue you remember what we just read in verses 1 and 2? Teach my works to your children and to your grandchildren so that they will know me. It wasn't okay for just the men to go out in the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord. He wanted the women to be there as well. He wanted the children to be there as well so that they could worship the Lord together. Verse 10, then he said to them, this is sarcastic, the Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, the evil is ahead of you. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desired. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Again, he hears what he wants to hear. He remembers what he wants to remember. And he says, take a hike. It's the first time we've seen Moses and Aaron get kicked out of his presence. Verse 12. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened. And they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, so there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. They ate everything. At the end of chapter 9, we read that some crops were destroyed, but that some hadn't fully grown yet. But now, everything that remained was destroyed by the locusts. You can look this up online if you want to. I was on various National Geographic and BBC type sites this week. But if you've ever seen land destroyed by locusts, it looks a lot like a fire has gone through. Because any green vegetation is gone. They eat it all. A locust can eat its own body weight every day. Um, I, I think the number is 80 million is actually kind of a small swarm of locusts. And it can eat the same amount of food in one day as 35,000 people would eat. And this is still going on. If, if you research it, there are still locust plagues on earth in different places today, primarily in the Middle East, in Africa, and, and parts of Asia. And the result is horrible famine because they eat everything in sight. And that's what was happening here. Total destruction. Everything that remained. Now this plague of locusts was another attack on Egypt's false gods. They, they worshipped a false god who was responsible for the sky. Another who was responsible for the crops. Another who was specifically responsible for the grain. Another who was responsible to keep pests away. And all of them failed miserably because they were false gods. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. Then Pharaoh called out for Moses and Aaron in haste. He, he called them to come. So soon after he kicked them out, he said, please come back. And here's his false apology again. Please forgive my sin only this once. That's one way we can tell it's a false apology. He believed he had sinned only once and that it wouldn't, wouldn't happen again. He described this locust plague as death. Take away from me this death. Verse 18, so he went out from Pharaoh and entreated, that means he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord turned a very strong east wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. Again, Moses prayed. Again, God answered. Again, the deliverance was complete because not one locust remained. But again, Pharaoh refused to let the children of Israel go. The ninth plague, like the third plague and the sixth plague, came without warning. Verse 21, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. This plague was a direct assault on their chief god. And I will give you the name of this one. Ra, or Re, or sometimes Amon Re. This is the Egyptian sun god. And they believed that this deity 
was their creator. In the ancient world, darkness of this magnitude was considered judgment on a very significant sin or repeated sin. Well, that's what's going on here. Pharaoh, over and over, has refused to obey. And the judgment that comes in the form of what we call the ninth plague is darkness. It says darkness that can be felt. It could have been related possibly to a sandstorm, but it was supernatural darkness because it lasted for three days and they couldn't see. There may have even been something going on that God was keeping their little lamps from lighting anything up because it said they didn't go anywhere for three days. We're not used to this. If we turned all the lights off in here, there'd still be light seeping under the doors. If you've gone to a cave in recent years, they used to turn off all the lights and you get to experience complete darkness and now that doesn't happen because of our cell phones. So most of us haven't experienced this type of darkness. But when you do, we experienced this in, in Spain just because it was very nice and dark in the rooms we were in and we were trying to figure out where am I, where's, where's the bathroom, that kind of thing. You're confused. You're disoriented because you have no frame of reference and that's what they were experiencing. Well, God sent this judgment of darkness for three days because of Pharaoh's sin and the sin of his people. There's some other times in the Bible when darkness came. And the one I'm thinking of is when the religious leaders turned Jesus over for the Romans to crucify him. Humanly speaking, I don't think there can be a greater sin than crucifying the Son of God. And the judgment that God sent was three hours of what? Darkness. So they're experiencing darkness that may be felt. It's an attack on their sun god. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Isn't that good? I don't know how God did that, but he did. They were unaffected there in Goshen. Would you agree that the, the world around us is a dark place? Anyone want to argue against that? So if you agree with that statement, is your home different? Is your home a place of light and wholeness in a world of darkness and brokenness? What does a home that's filled with light look like? Does your family read and obey God's word? Does your family cry out in prayer to him? Do you think about and then act on things that are true, noble, just, pure, of good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy? If not, what changes do you need to make with the help of the Holy Spirit so that your home is a home of light in a dark world? Verse 24, then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, go serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. So here we have the fourth compromise. Pharaoh's final attempt at compromise was to let the entire family go but leave the livestock behind. He's still trying to bargain with God. It's, it's hard to say exactly what he's after. He may have been thinking, well, our livestock is dead for the most part. Let's just keep theirs. Or he may have been thinking, this is my leverage now. I'll let them go, but they won't stay out there in the wilderness. They'll come back because otherwise they'll starve. They won't have anything to eat. Whatever his thinking, he's still trying to bargain to get leverage with God refusing to obey. Now, we've talked about the fact that Pharaoh represents Satan, Egypt represents the world, so I'd like to reevaluate these compromises and work through them one more time. So, we'll put them back up on the screen. Here are the four. Worship your God here in the land, and then, okay, not, not in the land, but don't go very far. Stay Stay close. And then the third one that we saw today, don't take your entire family, just the men are going to go. And the fourth one, don't take your flocks and herds, leave them here. So I'd like to paraphrase them and modernize them a little bit so that we can apply them to our own situations. First, in the land. Here's the lie for today. Don't leave the world. Stay right where you are. Don't change anything in your life. God won't ask you to make any changes to your life. 
You're fine just the way you are. Second one, don't go very far away. If you must leave the world, don't go very far. Don't become one of those Jesus freaks, those radical Christians. You can be saved without being a disciple. Well, here's what Jesus said. These are from Luke. Luke 9, 23. Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Later in Luke chapter 14, Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you desire to follow Christ, there will be change. There will be sacrifice. There will be self-control. There will be change. What about the new one for today? The third one. Not your little ones. If you must become one of those all-out disciples, at least keep your faith to yourself. You don't need to influence your family members. Religion should be a private matter. You should let your children decide for themselves. You heard that? Parents believe this lie from Satan that goes back to Pharaoh in Egypt, and they say things like, I'm not going to try to influence my children for Christ because I want it to be their decision. There's an element of truth to that. Every person has to make a decision to put your faith in Christ and to repent of your sin. That, that is a personal decision. You can't make that decision for anyone else. But teach your children. Share the gospel with them over and over. Tell them how the gospel affects your everyday life. And some of you are saying, okay, that sounds good, but how do I do that? So I'm going to give you an example. may apply to some of you, may not, but at least give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Imagine I'm at home, and I, I have to come into the room and have a conversation with my kids and say, kids, I really blew it a while ago. I know you heard me talking on the phone, and I lost my temper with that person, and I, I eventually asked that person to forgive me, and now I'm asking you to forgive me. I need help. I need Jesus' help to control my anger. I need Jesus' help to control my tongue. Will you pray for me if the child is old enough to do that? That's the gospel, folks. That's the kind of conversation that needs to happen in our homes so that we will have homes of light so that we will be telling our children and our grandchildren the works and the ways of the Lord. And it starts with us. And it starts with humility. Are you hearing God's question? How long before you humble yourself before me? But there's one more. Not your flocks and herds. If you must drag your family into this as well, at least keep your stuff out of it. You work hard for your money, and you barely have enough to get by, so don't even think about giving it to the Lord. Other people can give their money to the church or to missions or to people who are in need. But you should do only what makes you happy with your money. Again, let me share the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A few, a few verses later, Jesus says, you can't serve God and money at the same time. It doesn't work. God wants us to treat our stuff and our money in a way that acknowledges and supports his priorities, his kingdom. Why? Because when we do that, he knows our hearts will follow. Our hearts will then support 
his priorities, and his kingdom. It's not that God needs your money. It's all his anyway. But here's the thing. If I'm invested in something, maybe some of you have a retirement account. And you check your balance frequently. Why? Because you care about that, because you're expecting it to grow. You're hoping it's going to grow. That's important to you, so you keep checking on it. Well, if I'm investing in eternal things, in the kingdom of God, in his global work around the world, if I'm investing in that, I'm going to see how it's doing. I'm going to read that missionary letter. I'm, I'm going to pray for this person or that person. I'm going to hold my stuff loosely, and I'm going to be generous with others when I see a need. Because God is working in my heart, and as, as I store up treasure in heaven, that's where my heart's going. That's what I care about. So here's the bottom line. Don't compromise. Don't listen to Satan and his lies. Don't listen to the world around you. Seek God and live for him. Teach your children about God. And then treat everything you are and everything you have as if it's God's. Because it is. Verse 25, but Moses said, you must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. You may want to underline that statement. What is Moses saying? It's not about the animals. There will be no compromise. This is what God is commanding, and this is what we're going to do with all our heart and everything we have. We're going to obey. Not one hoof will be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord when we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me take heed to yourself and see my face no more for in the day you see my face you shall die so moses said you've spoken well i will never see your face again now i realize some of you are thinking that doesn't seem right there are more conversations later well i think there are two explanations for that and we'll talk about them over the next few weeks i think part of this is that chapters 10 11 into 12 some of it may be told a little bit out of order so that I'm not sure Moses walks right out of the room when he makes that statement. I think he's saying, we won't have any more conversations like this. We're not going to have any more back and forth offers of compromise. That's over. In fact, the only time they're going to talk again after this sequence of 10, 11, and 12, the only time they're going to talk again is after the death of the firstborn when Pharaoh is not pleading that don't take your animals, don't take your children. He's saying, get out of here, go. It's a very different conversation. I think that's what's happening. But what is the main point for us today? Don't compromise your faith. Do not compromise your obedience. Is there someone here today, you've never humbled yourself and repented of your sin? And God is asking you, how long until you humble yourself before me? Well, what does that look like? That means that I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I need a Savior and that Jesus is that Savior and I am turning from my sin and I am turning to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's calling out to him. It's crying out to him. It can be a prayer as simple as, God, I've sinned against you and I deserve punishment i deserve eternal death but i'm asking you to forgive my sin and save me and give me eternal life and i believe you can and he will so that's one possible response to this believers if you have children if you have grandchildren are you teaching them the works and the ways of the lord is that a priority for you for your time for your money for for your efforts And then are you treating your possessions as if they all belong to the Lord? 100% of it is his. 
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our Father, would you continue to work your word into our hearts that we would obey, that we would be humble, that we would be flexible and soft-hearted, the opposite of what we keep reading about Pharaoh. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way it applies to our lives today. I pray that you continue to teach us what you have for us. And we pray your blessing on this time of remembering your sacrifice for us. In Jesus' name, amen.